The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The more intelligent a person is, the more sure he is to be interested in life insurance. This explains why the commercials on this Equitable Life Assurance Society program always treat you like an intelligent human being. They specialize in giving you information. Tonight, for example, the Equitable Society is going to talk to fathers and mothers about establishing an equitable education fund for their children. That's the painless way to pay for a college education. If you want to be sure that your children get the head start of a college education, you'll be keenly interested in this Equitable Society message due in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, Draft Dodging Incorporated. chosen by the Federal Bureau of Investigation for this evening is one which took place in the year 1944. Where were you at that time? If you were part of one-tenth of the population of this country, you were a member of America's armed forces, stationed anywhere from Omaha Beach on the shores of France to a tiny atoll somewhere in the Pacific. Or maybe you were one of the millions who worked a swing shift in a defense plant and helped produce the weapons which brought victory to the Allied cause. You might even have been following your regular occupation and contributing to the war effort in your own way. For almost every American did his best to end the worldwide carnage as quickly as possible. There were, of course, exceptions to that rule. To a small group, it mattered little when victory came, so long as it didn't come too quickly. That group, which is among us at all times, is the army of American criminals. To them, as well as to the decent people of the nation, it makes a difference whether or not the nation is at war. For in wartime, more people seem to have money. Money the criminals must find a method of getting. Of getting without working for it. Of getting the easy way. Tonight's file opens on the lawn of a large estate located on the outskirts of a Midwestern city. A charity bazaar is in progress with all proceeds going to war relief agencies. Along the makeshift midway, a tent has a sign over it reading, Madame Omar, fortune teller. Inside, a gray-haired, well-dressed woman sits listening to Madame Omar tell what the crystal ball says about her future. And I see you in a beautiful white gown, walking down a long hallway. A long hallway where there are no doors, and the ground slopes gently downward. What does that mean? No one can cross your path and spoil your plan. The vision is beginning to fade now. Slowly, slowly. Fading. Do you have any more questions? Well, no, I... I guess you've answered everything. That will be five dollars. Oh, of course. There you are. The spirits thank you for joining us. Oh, there, uh, I mean, uh, oh, you're welcome. Uh, goodbye. Good day, madam. Mom! Mom! Oh, hello, dear. I've been looking all over the grounds for you. <laughs> I went in to have my fortune told, and Glenn, she's very good. Oh, you mean you're going to get married again to a tall dog? That's not what she said at all. For your information, the most important thing she told me was about you. How did I get mixed up in it? While she was in her trance, a black cloud appeared in the crystal ball. That meant something was worrying me. Oh. So I told her about your registering for the drive. Oh, Mom. 
And just as soon as I told her that, the black cloud disappeared. I suppose that has meaning, too. Of course it does. You're not going to be drafted. Huh? She didn't know how or why, but she was positive you wouldn't be drafted. <laughs> Mom, you sound like you believed her. I do. Well, I'll tell the draft board the whole story when I go for my physical. <laughs> Come on, Mom, let's go see the rest of the bazaar. Oh. That you, John? Yeah. Bazaar over? Uh-huh. How'd it go? Um, just about ready to turn in my crystal ball. <laughs> Martinis in that shake of coin? Mm, help yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you find any prospect? Yeah. Yeah, I got a list. There's only one that's worth tapping, though. Um, a Mrs. Alice Marshall, 135 Greenwood Avenue. Yeah, good neighborhood. She's loaded and a widow. How many children? Just one boy. He's due to take his physical later this week. Mm -hmm. What else you find out about her? Does a lot of charity work. No help. Mm, sees every show that comes to town. No. Goes to the symphony Tuesday nights and the opera Friday night. Maybe. Goes horseback riding in the park at 10 o'clock every morning. That's it. Oh? Tomorrow morning she'll have a companion to ride with. Easy, girl. Hang on there. Hang on. What? Let go of those rings. Oh, uh, well, please. Uh, oh. well, uh, I didn't think I'd make it. Oh, oh, what's the meaning of all this? Your saddle strap's loose. What? Well, well, so it is. Uh, I'll hold the reins. You better dismount. Well, thank you. Easy. Oh, dear. Yeah, just a minute. I'll fix it for you. Oh, boy. Can Easy. I help you? No, no, that's all right. Hold steady a minute there, fella. There we are. Well, I can't tell you how much I appreciate oh, this. I don't mention it. Aren't you Mrs. Marshall? That's right. I thought I recognized you. I'm sorry, I... Oh, we've never met. I saw you at the draft board. I was there when you came down to appeal for a change in your boy's classification. Are you on the draft board? No, no, I'm a doctor. I do some volunteer work for them. Oh. Mrs. Marshall, I examined your son's file after you left. What for? Well, the things you told the board about him interested me. If those records are right, he's an exceptional youngster. Indeed he is. Which fits right in with one of my pet theories. What's that? Well... I, uh, don't like to sound class conscious, but there's no denying a certain group does give this country its leaders. Oh, yes, yes. In 10 or 20 years, boys with the advantages your son has had will have to make up that group. Isn't this amazing? That's just what I tried to tell the draft board. Really? Um, doctor, uh, maybe, um... Uh... Maybe they'd change their minds if you'd talk to them. Oh, I'm afraid not. But they've got so many other boys. One less won't make any difference. I'm afraid the board doesn't think in those terms. No, I, I guess not. Oh, if only something could be done. Well, maybe something can be. What do you mean? Let's ride to the casino and get some tea. We'll talk about it. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is in the teletype room when Agent Dick Phelps enters. Hello, Dick. Hi, Jim. I just found your message. Boss team is up again, eh? Yeah. Another bank job? No, draft dodging this time. Oh, excuse me, Dick, will you? Hey, Art. Right. Yes, Mr. Taylor? If anything comes in for me, will you please deliver it to my desk? Sure. Thanks. Come on, Dick. I'll tell you about it on the way. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Jim. A report came in this morning from the Bedford City Police. It was a complaint on a swindler named John Harper. You said this was a draft dodger case. That's right, it is. This Harper poses as a doctor for selective service. 
con some wealthy people into paying him to get their son a deferred status in the draft. And believe it or not, the boy actually got the deferment. Oh. Well, Harper sent a young man that he keeps in his employ to take the other boy's physical. This substitute has bad lungs, among other things. Oh, so he flunks in the real draftee's name. That's it. <laughs> Parents of the boy went to the police after Harper came back for a second installment. Well, then they should have been able to supply a pretty full description. Oh, not only that, they also came up with a sample of Harper's handwriting. It's en route to Washington now. You notified the police here yet? Yeah, they're checking hotels for us, and as soon as a composite picture on Harper is finished, we'll go into action ourselves. Is it, Mom? Did I waken you? No. Would you like to turn on the light? Oh, sure. I want to talk to you, son. Okay. Glenn, dear, you know that fortune teller I went to see at the bazaar. Do you remember what she told me? About the tall, dark man? About your not being drafted. Oh, was that? She was right, Glenn. You aren't going to be drafted. What? I made all the arrangements today. Mom, what are you talking about? I met a man from the selective, uh, whatever they call it. His name is Dr. Raymond, and he's fixing it so you won't be called. Oh, Mom, how could he do that? I'm paying him for it. You're what? I'm giving him a thousand dollars. Mom, do you realize what you're doing? Of course, dear. He's keeping you out of the army. Oh, no, he isn't. But everything's been taken care well, of. Well, call it off and get your money back. Now, Glenn, I I'm mean a... it, Mom. I'm not trying to sound like a hero, but if other guys are going into the army, I'm going too. Don't you realize, dear? Don't you realize you're all I've got? Mom, just see this guy and call it off. Oh, but I... I don't want to discuss it anymore. Good night, Mom. <laughs> That draft Dodger case, Jim? Yeah. Just got this in from Washington, Dick. Well, what's the dope? Well, Harper's real name is John Wilson. He's got a whole string of aliases, though. Mm. You ever worked that fake doctor swindle before? Only in Bedford City, as far as we know. By the way, how much did he get on that job? $200. When he came back for the second installment, he picked up another $300. Yeah. What's his pre-war record? Bad checks from coast to coast. Well, I guess draft dodging pays better. That <laughs> must don't forget, we know about the Bedford City swindle because the parents complained. There's no telling whether some others are keeping quiet. That substitute who takes the physical, Jim, have we got any description on him? No, he's never introduced to the victim or to the actual draftee. Well, if we could find out what... Yeah. Oh, pardon me, Dick, will you? Yeah, sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, that's right, sir. Well, you did when? Are you sure... Thank you very much, Mr. Logan. Wilson's here in town, Dick. Who was that? The owner of the barber shop at the railroad station. He just saw Wilson's picture and remembered that he was in day before yesterday for a haircut. Come in. Dr. Raymond, to see you. Send him in, please. This way, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Marshall. Good morning, Doctor. I, I'm so glad you're here. Is something wrong? Oh, well, I... I had a talk with my son last night. Oh, about our arrangement? Oh, yes. He, he, he didn't approve of it at all. He asked me to call the whole thing off. Well, I'm afraid it's a little late for that. As soon as I made certain that no members of the board knew your son, I sent his substitute over there. He's taking the physical examination right now. Oh? Well, Mrs. Marshall, that's what you asked me to do. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, but, uh, well, I had hoped that Glenn would see it our way. Uh, doctor, do you think that you could talk to him? Well, I... Uh... I'm sure you could convince him that this is right. That he shouldn't go into the army? I don't think he could, Mom. Um, uh, Glenn. Is the man you made the arrangements with? Uh, yes, dear. Uh, this is, is Dr. Raymond. Well, hello there, son. 
I'd prefer it if you got out of here. Glenn. I don't want to have anything to do with this deal. Uh, Glenn, he's only trying to help us. I don't want that kind of help. I don't want any special favors. Son, there's a reason for doing this. I know. A thousand dollar reason. That is what my mother paid you, isn't it? Glenn, will you please? I want you to get that money back, Mom, and if he won't give it to you, I'll call the police. That would be rather foolish. You mean they wouldn't arrest you for a deal like this? Oh, they'd arrest me, all right. But they'd also arrest your mother. Oh! What do you mean? When she hired me, she broke the law just as I'm doing. Oh! Now, would you like to see her go to jail, too? Why? Would you? No. Then I'd suggest that you do as your mother wants you to. I'll take it. Hello? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's for you, Doctor. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Yes, well, that's fine. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Congratulations, young man. For what? As of ten minutes ago, you're 4F. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children. We're going to ask you to take a quick trip into the future, to the year 1960 or 65, to the day when an excited youngster of yours comes to you and says... Yeah, Dad, I bought my railroad ticket today. College, here I come. That future college freshman of yours will have three good reasons for feeling on top of the world. First, college men and women earn more money. Look, Dad, here's a magazine article that proves that an investment in college education pays big dividends. It says that in their working years, college men earn $72,000 more than non-college men. Second, college men land the bigger jobs. Uh, and get this, Dad. The article says that out of every 16 men earning $10,000 a year and up, 15 are college guys. Boy, isn't that something? Third, college men get more out of life. They gain a broader outlook, acquire an appreciation of art, good books, and the finer things of life a firm foundation on which to build a happy and prosperous future. So, Mother and Dad, it's up to you. Up to you to give your children the chance they so richly deserve. Up to you to make sure by starting an equitable education fund now. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's all ready for him. That's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your equitable society representative show you how little it costs to start an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. -E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Draft Dodging Incorporated. Fortunately for the nation, mothers like the one in tonight's case are few and far between. Not that every parent wouldn't like to protect his child from the rigors of war, but most realize that since it threatens the home of everyone, war is not an individual enterprise. In this atomic age, victory comes only through joint effort. Military might at the front cannot be maintained without workers at home in defense factories. Those workers cannot receive wages unless the government pays for the equipment it gets pays with money raised through taxes and the sale of war bonds. At this time, our country is engaged in conflict, conflict which may yet prove to be the beginning of a third world war. Should that come, despite all our efforts to the contrary, 
the men of your FBI would again be charged with fighting not only the ordinary lawbreaker, but also those criminals who ply their trade in wartime. Men like the one we have called John Wilson. However, even in their war against the John Wilsons of the country, the full judicial processes of democracy will be observed, as they were during World War II, as they have always been. No home, office, or place of employment will be entered without a search warrant. No arrest will be made without a charge, and there will be no suspension of the habeas corpus, for in those things lies the full essence of why we will be waging war. The American credo is based on the freedom of the individual, on our fundamental premise that the citizens rule the state, not vice versa. In short, we believe in liberty and in the fact that it's worth fighting for. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office as Special Agent Phelps approaches the desk of Agent Jim Taylor. Hey, Jim. Oh, hello, Dick. Hey, what's all that stuff? All copies of a chest X-ray and a complete physical report. Whose? The boy who substituted for the draftee in Bedford City. Oh. I wired the draft board up there last night, just after you left the office. So if we can only find out what that bird looks like on the outside, we'll have something. How? Well, we could get more of a break than that. Oh? How? We're lucky we'll find out whether Wilson's located a victim yet around here. You... You better lay that out for me, Jim. Well, I had one copy of the X-ray and one of the physical report made for each draft board here in the city. Uh Uh-huh. Anybody showing up with these exact ailments has to be our man. And whatever name the substitute uses is the name of the victim. Oh. Come on, Dick, will you grab that bundle there? Yeah, where are we going? Deliver these things to the draft boards. you, Gloria? Yeah. Uh, get out the crystal ball. Hmm, have I got a job? Well, this one's for us. Steve, it'll show you a thriving community filled with indulgent mothers. What's the matter with here? <sighs> We've run into trouble. With the Marshal, Jane? With her son. He turns out to be very patriotic. Oh? I managed to shut him up, but I'm afraid it's only temporary. It was probably the trunk. I asked him to send it upstairs. Now let him in, will you? Okay. Yes? I want to see Dr. Raymond. Who are you? My name is Marshall. He's not in. Where is it, Gloria? Not in, huh? Uh, look, uh, come back later. Oh, no, I want to see oh, him now. Just a minute. I want to see him now. John! Dr. Raymond, I want to talk to you. We have nothing to discuss. Oh, yes, we have. I want that money my mother gave you. Do we have to go through all that again? I told you yesterday. Things have changed since then, Doctor. I've enlisted. What? I didn't use my real name, but I'm in the service. That'll clear my mother. Now, let me have that money. Let me have it or I'll call the police. Very well. John. Eh, there's you... nothing else I can do. The money's in here. Come with me. Okay. John, are you Let out of your mind? Let me handle this, Gloria. Go ahead, son. Okay. Uh, All right, Gloria. Start packing and meet me at the station. Where are you going? To see the boy's mother. I plan to make another collection from her before we leave town. Dick. Oh, Dick. Right. Been waiting long? No, no, no. Well, we sure got a quick return on that draft board angle. Well, one of them check in already? Yeah, didn't they tell you when you called into the office? No, I only spoke to the switchboard. Oh. Well, Wilson's been in action. His proxy was rejected yesterday morning. Which draft board called? Number 38 in the basement of Madison High School. Physical was taken under the name of Glenn Marshall. Got the address? 135 North Greenwood Avenue. That's where we're headed now. Oh, Miss. Yes? Have you seen the other agent who came in here with me? He's in the library. Thank you. Hi, Jim. Dick. I got a rundown on Wilson, or Dr. Raymond, as he calls himself. Yeah, so did I. You knew he was here two nights ago and talked to Mrs. Marshall? Yeah. And that he returned yesterday morning and met both the boy and his mother? Yeah, I got that. I also learned he just left here. Oh? Talked to the butler. You ever heard them discussing money? Mrs. Marshall said she had to go to the bank to get some. Mm, Sounds like our swindler was getting paid off. Yeah, yeah. Did the butler tell you where she banks? Well, he knew where a checking account was, but that doesn't help because he heard her say she was getting this money from the savings department. Maybe it's in the same bank. No, I checked, Dick. It isn't. 
Mm. Would anyone else know where she had the savings account? Only his son. They say he's due back at any minute. Dick, we've got to stop Wilson from making that collection. Well, there are 50 banks, Jim. Well, we'll alert as many of them as we can, but our main hope is that young Marshall gets back here in time. <laughs> here. Oh. Did you get the money? Yes. Uh, it's right here in this envelope. Well, may I have it, please? On one condition. You must promise that this is positively the last I'll have to pay. Oh, Mrs. Marshall, I'm leaving town. Doesn't that convince you? Well, uh... Let me have the envelope. Mom! Uh, Glenn! Uh, don't give him that money. What are you doing here? I didn't like your apartment. Now, let me have that envelope. But, Glenn, I... You're not giving it to him. Oh, yes, she oh, is. Give that back. Let go of me. Oh, no. Please. I said let go of me. Please. All right, bring it up. Please. Bring it up. We'll take care of it. Hey, oh, what is this? Heaven. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. John Wilson and his two accomplices, the fortune teller and the substitute draftee, were tried and convicted in federal court for violating the Selective Training and Service Act. Each was given a sentence of five years. Young Glenn Marshall, upon escaping from the swindler's apartment, returned to his own home. There he met Special Agent Taylor and supplied the name of the bank where his mother carried an account. Agents Taylor and Phelps were then able to make the arrest. From notes found in Wilson's pocket, they were also able to apprehend Gloria Stone, the fortune teller, and the boy who had substituted at the physical exam. The draft board, which supplied Glenn Marshall's name and address, was, of course, a prime factor in the closing of this file. And at this time, your FBI wishes publicly to thank the members of every draft board in the nation for the generous cooperation it has received in the past and is receiving at the present time. The real wealth of America lies not in its physical possessions, but in its people. And never was this better illustrated than by the almost 200,000 men and women who have worked on draft boards during most of the last 10 years. Men and women who have done that work without one penny of compensation. In time of crisis, they heard the call of duty and answered it. Answered it as Americans with integrity and great devotion. one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom. Thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a documented recount of the activities of a gang of professional thieves. Its subject, bank robbery. Its title, The Gold Rush Stick-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Betty Blythe, Isabel Jewell, Bill Johnstone, Charles Maxwell, and Hugh Thomas. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Gold Rush Stick-Up on This is Your FBI. <laughs> <laughs>